This next presentation is by uh, Cynthia Calone, uh, Lear Lobo in Second Life. And uh, we're going to hear about uh, virtual world game simulation designs in this presentation, Blast from the Past, Games in Virtual World Education. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? <laughs> yes. <clears throat> okay, great. Well, here's my contact information, and I have slides available with a few more notes on them than you'll see in this slide deck in case you want a copy. On the cover image, you see one of my classes meeting in World. Most of my classes had about 8 to 20 students. Oops, i got to move around. There we go. Well, I'm Blair Lobo, Cynthia Colloin. I'm a professor at CTU and CCC Online, and uh, I'm a VR researcher from 95, right? And I, uh, I'm a game designer. I'm an enthusiast at all these things. I used to work for Air Force Space Command in the 80s and 90s. Remember the movie War Games? I ran the Situation Room software and some of those war games. <laughs> and I've taught, uh, yeah, I've taught uh, 52 virtual world classes. And so I'm a geek fest, right? And one of my first goals in 2007 was to isolate the benefits of teaching and learning in virtual world. So you see this list? This is what I had to sell to my administration, okay? In my classes, students create projects to model their ideas about complex constructs and to investigate probing questions. So it looks like we're playing games, but <laughs> early projects focused on usability design, accessibility, robotics, and amusement park rides. What a mix, right? And students studied how to manipulate state machines, manage prim navigation, program chatbots, and support users with specific mobility, hearing, and visual requirements. Our critics wondered why learning in these spaces mattered, right? We shared how virtual world classes use deep immersion to bring the course objectives to life, to, to apply the assessment criteria, to nurture self-determined learning, right? And of course, I asked my students, identify the answers to these criteria that you see here on the slide, and to reflect on the pedagogy, right? What we're supposed to be learning, right? The andragogy, how adults learn. Adults don't read. They do trial and error. <laughs> and hudagogy, the benefits of encouraging self-determined learning, right? Through constructivism. I want people to create things, right? And cognitive apprenticeship. I want to be creating things next to them. So I moved my office into world, right? Hudagogy is really important, especially for doctoral students, right? And in the virtual world, I would lurk and watch my students tinkering and learning and struggling, right? And I would assess the process of learning. I guess I should type that. Because it's that process that matters to me, not the actual little arts and crafts we're doing, right? And doctoral students would meet with me underwater and, and talk about their research. And in the summer of 2006, I spent my vacation here and I completed 58 project classes and adapted those skills into my designs. I've created more than 700, I've completed more than 700 project classes. Yes, I count things. I'm a little OCD, right? And I continue to study mesh and retopology is how we take designs that are not very efficient and optimize them, right? <laughs> and then, of course, uh, texture creation, animation, etc. right? So then I moved myself to Ramapo because I said, how could I ever teach doctoral students or undergraduate students or even master students if I didn't understand how children learn? So I volunteered for two years, and I moved real, my alter ego, that's the reverse of Lear, right, over to Ramapo. And Peggy Sheehy used a barn raising motif to invite the world's finest designers to contribute their content. You'll recognize Lumiere Noir's ivory tower primitives in the top two images, right? That's what those are. And I created robots for Peggy. Uh, some of them would give out course materials, some patrolled, some interacted with students, etc. 
and I moved over there to support them. We had 400 kids each year, about 1,000 kids total in a three-year period, right? It was a one-way trip. So imagine going, and you had to pack everything you were going to take because you could never shop again. You could never leave the property. <laughs> that was a very different experience, okay? Now, in 2006, in October, MacArthur Foundation held a, a, a record-breaking event, and Global Kids offered a session on their human barometer. It's a technique for students to discuss topics and vote with their feet. So my students, I'd, do, I'd be talking, and they, they could use voice if they wished, or text, but they could also move. And the closer they moved to a line, the less they believed what something was, uh, whether it was true or whether it was myth or truth, whether it was agree or disagree, whatever it was. And I would ask outrageous questions and make outrageous statements to get everyone moving, right? And of course, you're seeing a few of them here. Here's another one of my classes. You'll notice we're not sitting. And I'm not doing all the talking. It just looks like I am, right? <laughs> They're all typing and furiously. In fact, I used to, um, I, I, I would erect all these castles, Gothic structures, etc. I would pay my students, okay, 10 lindens per answer and ask questions, asking them to number the answers. They typed like mad, right? Because they needed cool, they needed cool clothing. <laughs> and great tech, right? And so I would pay them. <laughs> now, I know that sounds odd, but I, my goal was to get them this to be their world, right? And for them to have ownership of it, to be creators. So I created this little learning simulation that some of you may have a copy of. If you don't, you can have one. It's called A Two Becomes a Lamp, right? A Tiffany lamp. And it takes only two minutes to make this. It takes 10 minutes if it's your first day in world. <laughs> and the goal here is to give people skills. Oops, I gotta move along. I won $500 for this, and I have a little note about it in the online slide. So there's more information online, okay? Here was one of the accessibility projects we did in, I wanna say 2007, and then we wrote a paper. Yeah, we wrote a paper and we, uh, we published it in an ACM journal, the class and I did. I did most of the writing, so my name's down first. <laughs> Normally I put the student's name first if they do most of the writing, okay? So um, uh, we wrote the paper, we, we published it, and then we presented it at one of those little computer science conferences. Regis University is here local, so our Eric could have, could have attended, you know? <laughs> we held it at our school that day. You know, so that's, yeah, that's like how small the there. world is. What's that? I would have liked to have been there. Yeah, that looks great. Thanks. I know. It was su such fun. Well, I've taught 52 classes in world, so I have a lot of different kinds of content. Here is slide 11. This is only looking at the first two years. <laughs> and so um, uh, this student has a deaf has excuse me has a blind father and she created a newsstand to read the news to him okay and then of course someone else created a refrigerator that the shelves move up and down and come out so you can get the milk from the back of the shelf if you're in a wheelchair and another uh, created um, a voting machine that even people in Florida could could vote and of course this was when Florida was taking a lot of humor Someone may have to type that for me. Poor Florida, right? But they, they had a tough time in one of the elections. And so I saw a lot of electronic voting <laughs> projects, right? <laughs> anyway. Yep, yep. <laughs> anyway, so learning how to perform these usability tests, that's very different than system tests because I could care less whether the stuff works. I really care about whether people can use it, right? So we're really thinking about people and their usability in these projects. We did a lot of activities, and in the upper right, this is the first day in world 
for that student. And I already have him creating not only Tiffany lamps, but I had him stretch it and turn them into pawns for chess, okay? So he's creating a life-size chess game uh, in the upper right. In the lower left, uh, she created a star, and then she created a teacup ride. And in the upper left, I had someone from Space Command, and of course he's creating missiles that launch. They look like big pieces of chalk that hit you, right? And so um, here's the maze game. I had an entire class that made one. Well, you know what's funny, Elise? It was never required to be here except for two classes of my 52, okay? <laughs> what I did was I made it so much fun that everyone grew curious. There'd be one person out of a class of 20 whose technology would not support it, and then we would help them, right? But here... Um, uh, we made a maze game, and you'll notice that it's floating up in the air, and there are freeze traps like World of Warcraft. There's spike traps. A Mickey Mouse hand comes down and slaps you around. It is so funny. I laughed so hard the first time I kicked off that trap. And so we're testing the traps outside the maze, and then they seeded them, and they created a little scorecard. They used a sensor script for the flag to attach and follow people. Yep. It was hilarious, right? And so, uh, and, that, and that was a class, undergraduate class, that was just supposed to be software design. But instead, we built it, we tested it, we refined it. We had, we had issues with the timing. And then we fixed it all in the same term. We could do so much more in world. So slide 14, we're looking at, uh, I taught a robotics class. And half another class got jealous. And so they decided they were going to create robots too, right? Meanwhile, the class down on the ground that's making 17 amusement park rides saw that they were making a cool game 300 meters up. So they took their train and, and raised it 300 meters in the air. And it was kind of like running down the virtual hall to go see what's that other class doing. That was so, so funny because the ground class was a master's class. It was uh, systems engineering methods and software engineering requirements. There are two classes. And up above is software design. <laughs> So it was so cute seeing them all inter integrating. Now I know our time is short, so I'm going really fast. And this is just two years of little classes, okay? So there's a quick look at some of the amusement park rides. And you can see how strange our, um, our track looks because it goes straight up in the air 300 meters, right? <laughs> at the other end, it's a roller coaster. And we turned on physics, in case you're wondering, because they said it wasn't very much fun until you crash. <laughs> so um, it was very interesting. We had callable train cars and all kinds of cool stuff. I even had students who were rocket engineers who did who write the software for unmanned rockets. So I had some some very talented people, and then I had folks who had never written a line of code in their life, you know. <laughs> and we were all scripting, by the way, okay? Not just the rocket engineer. We would look at scripts inside open source tools, like this Mahjong game. And it, and it has all these things you can reuse, right? And so we would study what other people had studied. You can have this. I have a copy. It's full permission, and all of its contents are. And when you first res it, none of those tiles are out. They res and erect themselves. And it's a multiplayer game. It'll allow you to play with two people. And if someone disappears or has to go to work, it'll allow a new person to join you in mid-progress, right? It's a, and it has lots of layouts. Yes, talk to me after the session, and you may have my Mahjong game. I did not build it, but it now feels like mine, right? Because I have totally deconstructed it. So let's see, we're on 17, aren't we? So, and, and I, I only have 22 slides, so we're almost done. Creation of content. Well, here you're looking at another place in the, in the world, and we're learning how to do towers and turrets. Uh, the robot there was for the Wired magazine and Lego Mindstorms project uh, to help um, market it. It was called the Big Robot on Campus uh, in 2006, 2007, and so it's one of my groups. Meanwhile, voice comes to world. I was teaching before voice existed, before Flexi, right? And so when you teach before these technologies, I was using the Phoenix Viewer. I still use this view, by the way, in Firestorm. Okay. <laughs> 
but it looks a little better. But I still love the old old pathways, and I loved how many different ways we could I lured other classes in. This is a management class on strategic thinking. They only joined me for one day because the school thought I was just absolutely insane. You have to realize I didn't have school support for like three or four years. So I did this all ad hoc. That's what I did. I said, hey class, wouldn't it be cool to also study in a virtual world, even while we're on a course management system? <laughs> And of course, many of my classes were fully online you know, after the first couple of years. So they're role playing and meeting. And of course, this is the thing that I think is most important. We often think about competencies, course objectives, assessment, all of those critical pieces of learning. We don't think about how much, do you guys remember back when you were young and you'd go to the cafe or to a pub or somewhere and you would gather with friends and philosophize and talk about all your grand ideas and would construct them in some fashion and you would share them and and you felt powerful like you were on top of the world right well we have that here in world and and it's such a benefit Thompson learning in 2006 through 2007 they have classes online for a thousand dollars in US dollars that they offered in Second Life for 200 lindens, the exact same class. You could get an entire certification program here in the virtual world for less than, you know, probably a thousand lindens, five classes or something. And all you, they required is that you had to dance while you did it. <laughs> they were studying people and their movement and its effect on learning. I thought that was wonderful. Yeah, and I used to watch them learn. I would go to the National Physics Laboratory and, and tour their nanotechnology lab and listen to their latest discoveries. And what was amazing about this is I felt, and this was in the UK, by the way, so for our keynote speaker, our second keynote speaker, um, I felt like I was bridging with people around the world and I was part of this great universe of learning. So on my closing thought, I want to encourage you to be courageous, to teach in every virtual world. Your questions and explorations are welcome now and in the future. I'm Cynthia Colloin, Lear Lobo, and I want to welcome you to Vakara. Thanks.